Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt. You know, the current financial crisis required a bailout. Many people didn't like it, uh, depending upon how they saw their political philosophy. Some felt it was too much intervention by government and the private sector. But it's obvious that we needed to do something because here we had the head of the Federal Reserve System, Mr. Bernanke himself, saying that based on what he saw, that we may have been three days away from the collapse of the entire economy here in the United States. And obviously, if this economy collapses, it becomes a worldwide issue. So let me go back for a minute on the history of these bailouts and, and why we needed them. Let's go back to the major one in 75. Because there's a thread here. Every one of these bailouts involved poor accounting and poor oversight, or the lack thereof. When we went back to 1975, and I had experience with that one, it was a terrible set of books. Nobody could piece together the financial condition of New York City. And no one knew that they had these tax anticipation notes. Some were called BAMs, some were called RANs, some were called TANs. They had all kinds of acronyms for things that showed that they had the ability to collect taxes on buildings. But the buildings, when the auditors came in, we found out were abandoned. They would never collect these taxes. So here you had a terrible set of books. My old firm, Arthur Anderson, had to bring in some of the best people to put together a financial statement for New York City. And we took New York City off the Mickey Mouse cash basis they were on. And unfortunately, the United States government is still on that system. When you go to the next bailout, the savings and loan uh, situation, why did that happen? Well. We had some very greedy people that were mortgaging commercial properties. Don't forget, these were in houses, commercial properties. And they convinced the Congress, in order to cover up the extent to which they were doing it, to pass something called regulated accounting principles for these savings, savings and loan organizations so they can almost pick their own values for the assets. That was a formula for disaster, and it just continued the problem to the point where it couldn't be solved, and we had to have a massive government intervention that cost the taxpayers $500 billion. Now we come to today. You're listening to Turning Hard Times into Good Times with your host, Jay Taylor. Welcome back. I am really honored to have the Honorable Congressman Dio Guardi, who had been elected to Congress as a two-term congressman. But what's really unique about Congressman Diaguardi is he's the only certified public accountant to ever have been elected to the House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, when I say honorable Congressman Diaguardi, mm -hmm. honorable is, the, is a term, it's a, it's a title for all congressmen. But this yes, congressman, I think, deserves it in real terms because he is out there working extremely hard to shed the light to the American people on, on what is going on in the U.S. government deceptive accounting practices, and, you know, he, he can see that because that's his profession as an accountant. Uh, and I would like to have you, just before we get started with the congressman, uh, truthingovernment.org is a website that you should go to where you can really uh, follow the work that the congressman has done uh, over the years since he left, uh, since he left public service. Uh, really, to start another public service, it's probably even more valuable. Congressman, welcome to our show. Thank you, Jay. Nice to be with you. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I just have to put kind of a modifier on the only CPA. I'm the only practicing CPA. In other words, I spent 22 years 
in the world's largest accounting firm at that time, Arthur Anderson, and left there to run for Congress. Nobody else had ever done that. Uh, I did find uh, five other CPAs, but they were attorneys who passed the CPA exams in states that you didn't need the experience, and they practiced as lawyers. So I just wanted to make that in case someone... That's that's an important (laughs) clarification, too, because there is a difference between having a degree and actually being working in the trenches, as you did, Arthur Anderson, that prestigious firm at the time. At the time, and, you know, it's amazing. You talk about prosecutorial hubris. Here, the Justice Department goes after the entire firm, 50,000 employees, not the three partners in Houston that that committed whatever those acts were with Enron. And, uh, you know, the firm's lost its reputation, lost its business. And two years later, the Supreme Court rules nine to zero in favor of Arthur Anderson. Uh, I mean, but the firm was dead. It's incredible. That is incredible. Well, uh, Congressman, why do you think it is that the, the CPAs are not more prevalent? I mean, we have, we have quite a few more doctors. We have some doctors. Well, we don't have enough doctors and engineers, but we are seeing, I think, a dozen doctors in the House and Senate. And by the way, I am the only practicing CPA in the House and Senate, so it's the entire Congress. Uh, I'm glad to see that more professionals in the last 20 years are coming in, as well as entrepreneurs. But by far, the major profession represented is the legal profession. And that might be natural to most because we're talking about the legislative body of government. Yes. And many of these uh, lawyers come out of the, uh, the, the Senate, the local Senate in the state and the assemblies in the various states, and then they come up a notch and they run for the federal government. Uh, but there should be more uh, accountants and other professionals. One of the reasons that you find that is that it's very difficult to run for office. You know, it's two different things, being a congressman and running for Congress. You have no idea uh, what it takes to run for major office in uh, the United States today. I mean, the, the, the communications needs. Uh, I had a hire in those days, Roger Ailes, believe it or not, the guy that became the president of Fox was my political consultant, and I spent hours with him and you know, spent a lot of money over four years to convert my presentation from what it was in business when I was selling Arthur Anderson and myself and my services to what I needed to do to get people to vote for me. You know, people don't want to know how bright you are. In fact, if, if Ailes told me, hey, they want to know how good they are, and you got to listen to them. If you want their vote, you better be listening to them, not talking to them. you got to answer their questions, obviously. So it was a big turnaround, and I think there are many things that CPAs can bring to the table, but they also need to know it is a vastly different kind of environment. I would hope that we could go back to the schools, and in fact, my own alma mater is Fordham University, and I'll be speaking there uh, again next year, and I'm going to the seniors in the business school. I graduated with a Bachelor of Science from from a Jesuit school. You just can't take business. You got to take philosophy, theology, English, and you graduate with a BS and not just a a Bachelor of Business Administration, but I have to go and try to get them to think about my experience, which was, hey, I built up my my uh, uh, my independence, I saved some money, I was there at Arthur Anderson 22 years, and I left. But I had savings so that if, God forbid, I didn't win, I could fall back on something. Not that I was going to go back to Arthur Anderson, and I said to myself, if I don't win, I could become an entrepreneur of some sort. Sure. I, was, I was 43 at the time. I'm now 66. Now, we need to cultivate that kind of thinking in professionals, that they should build a career and then sometime later on in their life think of public service as a second career, whether they're in their 40s, 50s, or 60s. Right, of real service then instead of making uh, serving the people rather than the people serving you, which was the idea of our founding fathers, I believe. Absolutely. Now, Congressman, your practical experience was very, very valuable and is valuable even more now, I think, out of Congress in a way because you're letting people know what's really going on. Also, though, I think what's important, as I read a little bit about your background, is your, your humble origin. I mean, to me, that's very important because you can see the world as it exists for most people and not, you know, uh, as those with, that were born with a silver spoon in their mouth might view the world. Yeah. Your father came to America in 1929, I believe, um, looking for the streets paved with gold, but found something quite different and struggled and brought up his family. Uh, very, very honorable background. Could you talk just momentarily sure. about your father? We want to get into some of these nitty-gritty things that, that you're going to teach us, but 
Could you just uh, talk a little bit about your father and your mother and, and what sure. role they had to do in, in bringing you up and making you who you have been? Well, they're both from Italy. Uh, my father came here in 1929, of all years, to come to America looking for a job. And, you know, most of the people who came here were not people who were very literate. They were people uh, who were farmers, especially from southern Italy. Uh, they did go to grammar school. My dad had a fourth-grade education in Italy, couldn't uh, go here because as soon as he got here in 1929, his father was ill. He had three sisters and a mother to help support. So he went to Harlem, started si- shining shoes, and realized that not too far from there was the Bronx Terminal Market where he could buy greens, uh, collard greens, kale, mustard greens, and there's a very large African-American population in Harlem. And uh, within uh, a year, he established a stand on a corner, and by 1933, he had a vegetable store on 145th Street uh, and St. Nicholas Avenue called Sugar Hill. And by the time I was born in 1940, that was a grocery store in the South Bronx, Tremont Avenue, anything south of uh, Fordham Road, 190th Street, Street is called the South Bronx. So I was raised in effect, in a very European way. I had to go to the store after school. Many times when my father wasn't feeling well, he'd get me up at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, brought, brought me to the Bronx Terminal Market near the Yankee Stadium so I could load the trucks with him. Then he dropped me off at Fordham Road. My fellow students did not know that I was up at 4 o'clock. I was studying there on the benches and going into school at, at 8 o'clock. So it, it was great that I had kind of a a foot in the old country and a foot in the new country. I'm the oldest of his three children. And, uh, you know, that's an experience that you can never replace. It gave me confidence. You know, when you're in a a grocery store, a vegetable store, and you're meeting all kinds of people, uh, that, as a young person, gives you the confidence to deal with almost anybody or anything. And what happens is you make your mistakes early in life. And my father was tough. When I made a mistake, uh, I knew about it. And uh, it's amazing that when I went to college, Uh, and I was 17, uh, I don't think anybody could compete with me in terms of energy, discipline, because of having that uh, since I was about eight or nine years old. But he came here looking for a job, and he couldn't find one, so he had to create one. And that's what's great about America, because you can't create jobs. You can, you know, become creative and figure out what you want to do, but you have to go get it. You know, Henry David Thoreau in Walden Pond, and I love these old philosophers and sayings, and I'm a conservative Republican. I know he was a liberal Democrat, but parties don't mean that much to me. It's, it's thinking and creative thinking. He said when he was leaving Walden Pond because he realized he had isolated himself, he couldn't change anything, and he was going back, and he said, you know, I'd rather be on the ship at the mast than in the boiler room, and he said, you know, in life, you have to build castles in the air. In other words, you got to be a dreamer, but you better go down and get your fingers dirty and build foundations under those dreams. That's what my father taught me to do. Well, amen to that. You know, your, your experience and the work ethic is, is what just I marvel at. Americans have lost that work ethic, but people that come to America dreaming and seeing that castle in the sky uh, and having then the opportunity, let's just hope and pray that we can keep that, Congressman, right. Guardi, because uh, there are things that are happening now that, that cause me to be somewhat concerned that that sort of freedom and ability to create an entrepreneurial uh, creativity might not always right. be the same as it's been. But I want to switch gears just a little bit, and thank you for sharing that about your dad and your mom. And I think that's, that's invaluable. You talk in your book. Um, you, you, could you just, first of all, just tell us the name of your book? Right. The name of the book is Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Uh, it's a title that I thought hard and long about. You know, after spending four years in Congress, having the background of a certified public accountant, I said, I need to do a real public service now and record in a short book, it's only about 100 pages, uh, what I thought was wrong with the system and how we might have the seeds of our own demise within the budget process of the United States of America. And um, so I wrote the book, and then what I put on the cover of the book was my version of a congressman's voting card. Many people, Jay, and by the way, Jay, call me Joe, okay? <laughs> hey, thank you. All right. Uh, my, what, what I thought about when I put that plastic card, there's Congress people vote with a card the same size as your credit card. It's a plastic card. It was in my wallet right next to my Visa card. And I realized every time I put this thing in the computer terminal at the end of a row of seats in the House of Representatives, I was increasing the national debt because we had deficits during the Reagan time. And obviously we have worse deficits now, but think about it. I mean, we were increasing the national debt 
We tried to, you know, restrain it with Graham Rudman. It didn't work. Uh, with the Budget Enforcement Act, it didn't work. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit. But I put that card on the cover of the book, and the first chapter I named a congressman's voting card is the most expensive credit card in the world. And I put a version of it on, a version of it on the cover. It says, credit line unlimited, expiration date never, bill to future generations. And therein is the problem. We're not allocating the costs of what we're benefiting it from today to ourselves. We're hiding it so the next generation pays for it. This is not the country my father came to. My father always felt that he wanted to leave something to his children, and he did. Uh, you know, not a vast sum of wealth, but a, a house that was paid for, and we sold it. My brother, sister, and I split that. We gave some money to charity, but at least there was something there, not debt. The country is not thinking that way anymore. We're just hiding Probably what we're spending. It's debt instead of assets to our future generations. And it's hidden debt because the accounting system is the worst kind. It's not the system that the Securities and Exchange Commission imposes on you if you're a publicly traded corporation or on the board of a publicly traded corporation, that's called generally accepted accounting principles. They're well-prescribed principles, and they have to be used to protect the shareholders. And if you don't do it, you get what is called, you get indicted for securities fraud. That happened with Enron and Tyco, and there are people in jail right now because they did that. But the United States of America is not imposing that system on themselves. They have what they call the cash basis, where you can manipulate things very easily. You can defer expenses, accelerate revenues, and there's so many other gimmicks you can use to balance the books superficially, yeah. but in effect burying a mountain load of debt and putting it on the next generation. Well, I want to get to some of the specifics. I know we won't have time to describe them all, Joe, but I would like to just mention to the listeners that in your book you talk about a deficit. And this book was written, ladies and gentlemen, back in 1992. But, Jay, it's more true today when you think about the fact that our deficit this year, and this is what President Obama has said, is going to be a trillion eight hundred billion dollars. Think about that. We haven't had in it's the hard Reagan to think years. about Joe because right. a trillion dollars is such a big number. But you talked in your book in 1992 about thirty one thousand one hundred and seventy four dollars and eighty nine cents as being the average amount that's uh, going to have to be paid by each taxpayer going forward into the into the future. That was the debt that was on the books then. Mm-hmm. How would that stand now? Well, it, it would be hey, triple. How high would that number be yeah. now? Because well, I'm sure it's a lot higher. Well, you know, when you look at numbers, we should look at the, the round numbers. There are approximately 300 million people living in the United States today. Uh, 100 million of them file uh, 1040s, actually a taxpayers, in round numbers. It could have changed a little bit. But basically, if you divide that 100 million into the debt at that time, which was, uh, you know, about $3 trillion, you had that 31000 Today, the debt on the books is probably right now closer to $11 trillion. Don't forget, we ended the fiscal year with Bush. That was September 30th, uh, 2008, with $9.3 trillion in bonded debt. The debt limit was nine point eight. Obviously, they had to raise that to accommodate the stimulus and all the other things. But when Obama took over... He started spending even more, and now if you look at what the debt will be at the end of this fiscal year, you're talking about probably $11 trillion. Now, if you took that same 100,000 taxpayers, uh, you're talking about 100. It's gone from 31000 to $100,000 per taxpayer. That is a mortgage pretty much on the, kids, the kid in that family the, or the children in that family. Uh, that somebody in that family in the future is going to have to pay that money. Now, worse than that, I just told you what is on the books, the bonded right. debt. In other words, treasury bills, treasury notes, savings bonds add up to $11 trillion. And by the way, it's not only U.S. people that are buying those. Uh, China and Japan account for $2 trillion, and we need more from China and Japan. And that's a problem. I gave a testimony in Congress two months ago saying, hey, we got to watch out for the long-term unsustainability, fiscal unsustainability of the United States of America, especially when we're borrowing from countries that don't share our values, and particularly China. Now we're hostage to oil from Saudi Arabia, and we don't share the Wahhabi Muslim, uh, you know, um, ethic or, 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 or philosophy, and and, we're, and and no women have rights there. And now we are doing the same with China. And guess what? Hillary Clinton went there. Did she even say boo about? 
the Tibet or Tiananmen Square? No, because we need more Chinese money. So we have to be very careful now that we understand the implications of spending money we don't have and where we're getting it from. Well, you, we've been doing it for a long time. In your book, you talk about Andrew Jackson. Uh, he had a, a passion for balancing the budget. We did have uh, briefly balanced budgets during Eisenhower and, and Clinton. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, is there any chance we're going to go back to any balanced budget? And is there any president that since Andrew Jackson that really shared that sort of passion or desire or understanding the need to balance the budget? Well, I would think we had a real balanced budget under Eisenhower, but there was no way that we had surpluses or a balanced budget under Clinton with the accounting system that I describe in this book. I mean, those were artificial surpluses. If you used the right accounting system and you accrued you know, losses the way banks have to do when they have bad debts and things like that, which we don't do, we just wait for a disaster and then we have what we call a bailout. And, and all of a sudden we float bonds and we add to the national debt. That is not the way you do things in the real world of the Securities and Exchange Commission and the banking system. So the point is that those deficits didn't exist under Clinton. That was a mirage. But it was a dangerous mirage because it kind of put us to sleep. And I remember people saying after I wrote the book in 1992, ah, Joe, looks like the book has no value anymore because now we have surpluses. And I said to them, no, under the right accounting system, you have still many debts that are not on the books. In fact, today, I just said what was bonded, if you add Social Security and Medicare alone, you're talking about another $50 trillion that is not on the books for the benefits of people living today that have to be paid. And if you're a publicly traded corporation, there are pension rules that require you to report that amount, even though you don't fund it. The issue is not funding. We're not saying put $50 trillion aside, but how about showing a liability for it? Right. We don't do that on the books of the United States. And I've been railing about this Inspector ever since I was in Congress. Properly, but so yeah. It's, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. You go to jail if you're in the private sector for doing that. But oh, obviously, that's, that's securities fraud. You could be indicted and put in jail, as Mr. Kozlowski is now from, uh, I think it's Tyco. Uh, I think it was Tyco, but yeah. there's several corporations where there are executives sitting in jail, even Enron, as you know. Uh, the chairman passed away, but the chief financial officer is sitting in jail right now, probably meditating on what he should have done right, you know? But, Joe, you describe Congress as being deceitful, um, and keeping the truth from the public sounds to me pretty much like the old mushroom farm, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Keep them in the dark and feed them you-know-what. <laughs> uh, can can right. you give us an example or two of how Congress really does that? I know that in your book, I mean, there's, there's numerous examples of the tricks they use, the gimmicks they use, to disguise the truth about their spending and the deficits and so forth. But could you sure. just give us, so you talk about fudging the numbers, off-balance sheet treatment. I guess you maybe hit on that one. Well, the big, the big one is the accounting. I a couple that are maybe the yeah. most important in well, your mind. Starting from the top, the accounting system, number one, is illegal, uh, and it should have been changed. We had the Hoover Commission mandated in 1955-56 the right accounting system. Congress was given five years to uh, uh, imp implement it. Uh, Eisenhower signed it, and it's still not implemented. Why? Because the people are not a constituency for it. They don't understand it, and that's why I wrote the book. But then you have, besides the accounting system, you have other budget gimmicks like, you know, one year in order to balance under Graham Rudman, that strict formula we had for four years trying to ratchet down the budget 25% a year from 1986, what they did is they created a military payroll that was 53 weeks in one year and 51 in another. In, other, in order to, you know, balance it this year, they pushed a week's payroll into the next year. You could do that on the cash basis. Then there's the so-called magic asterisk where you just say, well, we are short $100 million, but you know what? We're going to put an asterisk. Those are savings we're going to find later. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't do that with your bank. I mean, try to use these gimmicks uh, it, when, you, when you try to go to your bank for a loan or try to show them your, your financial statement. Maybe some of them did that and created the mortgage crisis we just had. Uh, God forbid we go back to that system where people don't have to give financial statements to get a mortgage. Uh, oh, my goodness, yeah. So, you know, um, Thomas Jefferson talked about the, the price of liberty being eternal vigilance, Joe, and what right. you're talking about here is the American people need to know this so they can scream about it, so they can, you know, vote these rascals out. Isn't that what we need? Absolutely, and that's why I have gone on a crusade since leaving Congress. I formed the foundation Truth in Government, 
when I wrote the book, I put it in the foundation so that the proceeds from the book went into it tax-free to then buy more copies of the book. Uh, I can buy 10,000 at a time, get it printed, and I give them out at colleges and, and high schools and uh, anywhere I speak, I bring a bag of these books with me and I hand them to the people, they take them, and I tell them to pass it on to their, uh, if you take more copies, pass it on. I was just at the Villages in Florida, Central Florida, and I was invited to speak uh, before the Republican Club of Sumter County, and I brought uh, 500 copies of the book. Uh, there were about 300 people there, and I said, take the other ones, send them to your children around America. It dawned on me, what a great way to distribute this book. Here are the people in Central Florida. Many of them have kids all over the country, and they did that, and, and I, I taped that, and if anybody wants to see that half-hour speech, it's on the website, www.truthingovernment.org. In fact, all of my speeches are there, and uh, I think people would, would learn something from that. And if people want a copy of the book, all they have to do is to write me, uh, email me at the website, uh, jjd at truthingovernment.org. JJD is, are my initials, Joseph J. Dioguardi, and I'd be happy to send them a, a, a complimentary copy of the book. That's really fantastic, Joe. We only have about two minutes to go here, and I have to ask you one more question. Recently, the Congress put a great deal of pressure, it seems, uh, on on the banks to sort of, or on the financial institutions, to start marking things, not marking things to market. Uh, do you have any opinion of that as a, as a CPA? Um, yes. my, my opinion is that we should not have changed the accounting principles to accommodate the banks or any crisis right now, because now when you change them, you don't know what the future, what, what is causing the future. Is it the change in the accounting principles or, 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 or substance? There were enough ways to interpret the rules on mark to market so that you could have come up with uh, very valid ways to, to, to value uh, the securities that some say could not be valued. I'm not an expert in valuation. But I think this was a way to just game the system once again. I remember when they had the SNL crisis uh, and we had the big bailout. The mother of all bailouts at that time was New York City. And then the SNL crisis came, right, the, the savings and loan crisis, that they created accounting principles called RAP, regulated accounting principles, so that you could then uh, put values on the books that would kind of justify uh, that these SNLs were not as bad as they were. And that hid the problem even a little bit more. So my feeling is when you start changing rules in midstream, then you don't know what's causing the problem anymore. And I would not have changed that. Now, I think... Well, there's the, no legitimate accounting principle or reason to ch have changed that, in your view. In my view, no. In my view, these are not marketable securities. We knew that. But there are alternative ways to, to value things, and, and they could have used those alternatives. Again, uh, you know, maybe in some cases uh, there was a, 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 a good reason... Uh, that these mark-to-market rules didn't work, but then they could have put on a nice big footnote to say what the problem was, that they weren't going to hold this, they weren't going to hold this to the end, and they thought it was valueless now, but the rules prevented us from... There's ways of disclosing those things, but to change it so that now the auditors have to face these issues on the balance sheets and whatnot uh, midstream, to me, that was not the answer. Well, that, that seems to be uh, what I would have expected from you, Joe. And with your background, I think we've got to respect your, your opinion on that as well, because you would have been the only member of Congress, if you were still in, who would have been able to opine on that intelligently. Well, I would have offered my opinions, uh, not that I'm an expert on valuation, but they wouldn't have uh, been able to make that change without really thinking hard and long about all of its implications. And even now, I think there are many in the accounting profession that are regretting the fact that we even opened that door. Oh, I'm sure that's true. Joe, I want to thank you so much for being my special guest this week. And, folks, I really do hope that you'll go to Joe's website and, and get a copy of his book and share it with your friends because this is of utmost importance to us as Americans, at least, and really to everybody around the world because America is so important in the world. And if we go down, if our budget system takes us down into bankruptcy and into a, a state of, of uh, ill repair, we're in big trouble, the whole world. So we can have to all do our own part to try to help each other understand the severity of it. Joe, thanks again well for your said, work. Well said, Jay. Well said. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it.